please welcome Anusa Ansari, Kate Marvel, and Nabiha Suklain, interviewed by Ina Freed. Welcome, everyone. Um, so I'm thrilled to have this conversation with these three amazing, badass women in science. And we want to talk some about the barriers um, that still exist um, for women in science. But before that, I want to take some time for the folks to get to know just your incredible journeys and accomplishments from three distinct but amazing uh, paths uh, into science. Uh, Nabiha, you, um, you're doing amazing work around personalized stem cell therapy, uh, working with Jennifer Downa, doing just incredible work. Explain to us a little what you're doing for English majors, and there might be a few English and business folks in the crowd. Love the English majors. Um, yes, yeah, so when you think about diseases like Parkinson's and age-related macular degeneration, you're getting these diseases because the cells in your body are dying or they're malfunctioning. And we don't always understand exactly why that's happening. So there's a new pillar that's emerging in medicine where the idea is to create brand new personalized cells, eye cells, brain cells, hair cells, and transplant them back into the patient. And it's quite revolutionary because uh, the first collaboration that Selino is working on, my company, is um, related to blindness. So we are making personalized retinal cells for patients, and it will either stabilize their vision loss or perhaps even regain some sight. So it is quite amazing. And the reason personalized is so important is that off-the-shelf therapies don't necessarily work for all of us, and especially for this room, it wouldn't cover everybody. Um, so as uh, this country becomes more and more diverse, I think it's very important to be able to make custom cells for each and every one of you at very low cost. And that's what my company is doing. We're automating the process of generating personalized human cells for a range of indications. We're starting in blindness. And um, yeah, I'll stop there. And all of us are here, thanks to the Birch Foundation, but you have another tie to the Birch Foundation and your work. Uh, tell us a little bit about that. Yes, last year um, was an amazing year for me. I'm absolutely so, so grateful. And one of the big reasons it was an amazing year for me is uh, because um, I received the uh, Tory Birch Fellowship at the Innov Innovative Genomics Institute. And it was a collaboration between the Tory Birch Foundation and the Innovative Genomics Institute at UC Berkeley that's led by Nobel laureate Jennifer Doudna. Yeah. <laughs> um, and uh, it was a life-changing experience for me to be a part of the fellowship because um, Jennifer and Tori came together to have this and had this vision to support a woman entrepreneur in science. Um, and that is so important given we heard a lot of statistics today uh, about how we need to do better on the diversity side. And I do think changing the face of biotech and science leadership is very important for us to be pursuing the right kinds of science. So um, that's how I got to learn about the foundation. And uh, really today, this whole experience has been um, life-changing, to say the least, because just learning more and more about how the foundation cares about this wide range of topics that are so important for our existence as human beings on Earth. It's humbling. And I'm thrilled to be here. Yes, so that's my, my connection with the foundation. Well, and that's a perfect segue. <laughs> Human beings and our existence on Earth is kind of what you specialize in. Kate, you're in this area of um, climate science, but particularly how it's influenced by human actions. What got you into the field? And really quickly, what, what should we know that we aren't paying enough attention to? So um, I originally started out thinking that I wanted to be an astrophysicist. So I got my PhD in cosmology, which is the study of the entire universe. And no offense to the rest of the universe, but it's terrible. Um, <laughs> And, and I, during my PhD, I realized that, that really Earth is the only good planet. Um, <laughs> I mean, that we know of. Um, and I remember thinking, why am I not applying my skills to studying my home? 
Um, and it turns out Earth is fascinating. There is so much to learn, and it is beautiful. Um, so my job is to work with a toy Earth on a computer, um, which we call a climate model. And Climate models are amazing. It's like playing SimCity all day. It's great. Um, you can do incredibly messed up things, like set off volcanoes when you're in a bad mood. Um, you can get rid of the Rocky Mountains and see what that does. But you can also do counterfactual experiments. You can see, oh, what would the Earth look like if human beings had not been emitting so much carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gases? And you can use models to try to see possible futures. I don't predict the future, I project the future. And if we continue to increase our carbon dioxide emissions, if we continue not to cut them, we are in a world of trouble. Um, so that's kind of the bummer, I think. Um, I, it is my job to study the problems, and climate change is a problem. In fact, I think it's probably the problem. Um, it's terrifying, it's overwhelming, and it's very, very serious. But the more I am active in talking about climate, and the more I reach out and I work with entrepreneurs, the more I work with social scientists, the more I work with community organizers, the more I realize that this is a problem that we can solve. We have so many of the solutions that we need to stop emitting CO2, to stop putting greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. And I've been really amazed by those. And I don't want to spend too long in Bummerland, but I want to ask you something that I've been wondering. Um, is, is it actually getting worse? Are the problems starting to, to um, interact with each other in ways that maybe your models didn't forecast? For example, um, if there's increased wildfires, those are emitting new CO2 gases. Were those all accounted for, or are we starting to see some of the problems compound each other in ways that maybe even the models didn't show? So I feel compelled to defend climate models as a climate modeler, um, so <laughs> take it with a grain of salt. Um, you hear a lot of people saying, oh, this is worse than we thought. And yes, it is worse than you thought when it happens to you. <laughs> um, we've been saying things like this are going to happen for a really long time. Now, of course, that doesn't mean climate models are perfect crystal balls that allow us to see the exact future. There are known unknowns and there are unknown unknowns. Um, uncertainty is not our friend. A lot of people think about uncertainty and they think, well, it could be really bad, it could be great, but it's probably going to be fine. And I want to be really clear that we have ruled out fine. Yes. So I want to pick up on something else that you said. So we're, we're staying in bummer, bummer land for a little bit longer. Um, but I want to pick up on something you started with, that Earth is the only good planet and the rest of it is boring. Because most of us don't have enough evidence to really evaluate that one way or another. But our final panelist, Anusha, has gotten the closest probably of anyone in the room to seeing some of those other planets. Um, one, is Earth the only cool planet out there? And talk about what it's like, um, what, what, how being in space, how has that impacted your life and what do you think it has to teach all of us? So Kate, I love cosmology and cosmology actually led me to love our planet Earth. And, and part of it was that um, I got very curious about the universe and you know how it came to be. How did Earth form? Why are we living on Earth? So all those questions made me love um, our own planet here. And when I had the opportunity to um, go to International Space Station and be able to just watch our planet sort of just go by, you know, every 90 minutes in front of my window, um, it made me appreciate how special it was. I, it definitely is the coolest planet, uh, the most beautiful one in our solar system. Uh, who knows the rest? We know nothing about our universe yet. Um, but one thing that is attractive about space to me is a unifying factor. Whether you're uh, just looking up at the night sky, we all feel like we share this night sky. And um, we can study astronomy and look up and it's the same no matter which country. And then I had this amazing opportunity to see our planet from space. And it was obvious that everything we learn in our geography classes with these maps and different colors and different lines that divide us, definitely they do not exist. And that we share this planet, it is. It, it's, it's, it's all about how we can understand that we do have one home, 
that it is only protected by this very thin layer of atmosphere that makes the whole difference about life on this planet, and that if we don't take care of it, you know, the Earth will be fine. Us? That's another story. So. And I do want to um, also bring in the conversation of how we do get more women and girls into science. And one of the things that strikes me to kind of start that, you didn't have role models. There weren't other um, Iranian uh, folks that had been to space. There weren't a lot of women in space. How did you get from a kid in a war-torn country to being like, I can go to space, I'm going to go to space, and I'm in space? What was that pathway like? <laughs> Because yeah, Billie Jean King story. wants to go to space. We were talking to her backstage, <laughs> so you can help chart her path. Yeah, yeah. No, I, so I, growing up, as I said, uh, I think um, curiosity was what drew me to space. I really wanted to find answers, and, um, and I wanted to study it. So when I studied, you know, my attraction to actually experiencing it grew. I grew up watching Star Trek dubbed in Farsi, so I was a big fan of Spock, not Captain Kirk, but Spock, because I wanted to be a science officer. I wanted to, um, I was thinking that perhaps if I come up with something really cool, an invention, that then NASA will say, oh my God, we have to fly her to space to test out this invention. That was my path. But of course, it didn't happen that way. And um, when I got the opportunity uh, at age 16 to come to US, I thought, this is now, this is going to be it. And that didn't happen. There was no Starfleet Academy for me to go study in. And uh, I became an engineer, entrepreneur, problem solver, which I loved. And later on, I applied those t uh, skills and my success in business to uh, try to make a difference in opening up access to space. And that's when I got involved with XPRIZE Foundation and the work we're doing there and, and how we apply innovation and entrepreneurship to solve grand challenges. And uh, now I'm the CEO there and continue to try to open up the new frontiers in every field of technology. One of the things that struck me throughout this day of just incredible, amazing speakers that we've heard from is how many people trace their current success back to that person who supported them, oftentimes a parent, um, somebody who told them they could do it. Um, and Nabih and I were having this discussion at dinner last night um, that there's a lot of women and girls who that isn't the message they're getting. It's certainly not the only message they're getting because it's not the message that we're sending in our popular culture, but it may not even be the message they're getting at home. Um, and I think this is a tough one, but I think if we don't if we don't look at it, we can't really solve a large part of the problem, which is how do we inspire women to success broadly, but particularly in science and technology, who may not have someone in their corner telling them you're going to be successful? Nabiha, we started it last night at dinner. Any, any uh, revelations overnight? It really comes down to the people who are going to support you. Um, when you're having a bad day, and you know, I did a PhD in physics, and there were many bad days. Most of it was bad days. <laughs> um, so having the right uh, friends and family members and just uh, people I was working with, a lot of my professors, who are those people that you can reach out to on a bad day and they say, it's going to be okay, you're going to make it. You really just need a little pep talk. And it's interesting because um, I grew up traveling the world. Um, I'm from Bangladesh, but I was born in Saudi Arabia. I grew up in Germany and went to high school in Sri Lanka. So it, it's very natural for me to bridge the gap. I'm always comfortable reaching out to people, knocking on doors, and that's my entire journey into entrepreneurship, having made inventions in a physics lab. Um, so anytime I, I went to a conference and I saw an amazing speaker on stage, a biotech entrepreneur or a CEO, I, I went up to them afterwards and said, I loved your talk, you know, I'm, I'm really interested, I'm pursuing entrepreneurship, or I'm curious about academia, would love to talk to you, get your thoughts. Um, and it's been an amazing experience connecting with um, folks I like to call my friend tours. Uh, friends slash mentors, but some of them have even become family. And we literally met at a conference like the one we're at today. So I think my big message is please build those connections, reach out to the people that you are drawn to and uh, lean into it because um, that's what's made my career uh, 
happened this far. So I heard two things that I really want to amplify. One is find inspiration around you, and thank goodness we're all in the best place I've ever been in to find that. But the second is also in your existing community, who are the pr people that support you, that encourage you? Because I think we all have a range of friends, um, some of whom we have a fun time with, but we actually leave maybe feeling less good because we're, you know, you know, I'm one of those people, like I get super encouraged. I see someone like uh, Rebecca on stage and I'm filled with hope for the world. Um, and then I, you know, pick up the newspaper or look at Twitter and I don't feel so good. So finding those people around you who give you hope. Um, Kate, when you're looking at a problem as enormous as the one of climate change, how do you stay optimistic, stay hopeful, stay encouraged that we can change things when, I imagine a lot of those simulations, unless you tweak it around and make some changes, don't look so pretty? Yeah, I, I have a weird relationship with hope, um, a very complex <laughs> relationship with hope. Um, but that's not because I'm a pessimist. That's because, to me, saying, do you have hope we can do something about climate change is like saying, do you have hope you can clean your room? Like, I don't know, do it. Um, and, and for me, the question is not really, are, should we be hopeful? The question is, what should we be doing? And right now, we know exactly what we should be doing. We should be decarbonizing the power sector. We should be decarbonizing transportation. We should be looking at our agricultural practices, which are contributing a lot of CO2 and methane to the atmosphere. There are so many things that we can do. Um, it does feel overwhelming and, and sometimes helpless and despairing when you look at the problem as an individual. Because no individual created this problem. Well, you know, maybe some fossil fuel executives. But no individual in this room, I hope, created this problem. Um, and, and that means no individual can solve this problem. But we are not all just individuals. Everybody is part of a community. You are part of a community of fronters. You are part of a community of it, your workplace. You're part of a community maybe at your church, maybe at your educational institution, your kid's school. We are all part of communities and we can all begin to have these conversations in these communities. And one of the most powerful things we can do about climate change is talk about it because the vast majority of Americans are concerned about climate change. We're just not talking about it. So talk about it to your friends in your communities and then call your senators and talk to them about it. So again, the thing I want to amplify is have difficult conversations, push the people around you to confront the things that are uncomfortable. Um, we only have about 30 seconds left. Anusha, um, when you look at XPRIZE, um, it's this great thing, applying entrepreneurship to science, and still the applications look like the world we're trying to shift, not the world we want. Um, how do we get more people? How are you working to get um, this, it, your applicant pool to look more like this room. Oh, absolutely. So, Kate, you do need to have hope because we are focusing on climate and energy. Uh, we have announced a $100 million um, carbon extraction at gigaton level because that's what we need, you know that. And, um, and we have invited the world and the world has responded and we're continuing to get more teams. One thing that as a woman in science, I would love to see more is women, more women leadership in these types of fields because our future will depend on a lot of the technologies that are being designed and developed and the voices of women are missing at these tables when the designs and services are designed, the products are designed. And therefore, when they get to market, they're not serving us. And I need to make sure that we pay attention to that. So my hope and my ask of this audience is go to our website, xprize.org, learn about the different competition, form teams. It's all about business. It's all about entrepreneurship. It's all about being ambitious. We're an ambitious organization, and we love ambitious women to come and join and participate and solve the problems that we all want to see solved. Well, unfortunately, I'd love to talk with you all day. I hope we get the chance to talk more, but uh, we are going to have to leave it there. Anusha, Kate, uh, Nabiha, thank you so much for all you do in your day jobs and for bringing all this wisdom thank to you. us.